Well, every night we've been trying to get your questions answered and getting us a medical perspective on the coronavirus situation. And to answer some of your questions tonight is Dr. Syra Madad, special pathogens expert, pr professor of the graduate biodefense and biosecurity program at the University of Maryland. Doctor, thanks for being here. I'll get right to it. Uh, first of all, we have Brian. Take a listen to this. Hey, Brett. What is the reinfection rate like for COVID-19? Is it like the flu where if you get it, you can still be reinfected or is it like the chicken pot where you have it once and then you're immune? Thanks. All right, Doc, how about it? So, well, first I'll start by obviously prefacing that we don't know a lot about this particular virus and I'm sure you've heard it many, many times. And so with that said, you know, there are reports of individuals getting reinfected, but these are not scientific studies, these are reports. And when we say scientific studies, this is backed by data and an actual methodology to actually prove or disapprove whether a patient or an individual does get reinfected. Um, so right now there isn't a whole lot of data to show that individuals can get reinfected. But what we know in terms of just basic infection, infectious disease and epidemiology is that it does confer some amount of immunity. Now, how long that immunity can last for, it just really depends. So with SARS, you know, there are studies that show you can have immunity for one to two years. But again, every virus is different. And in terms of how um, you know, how your immune the system is going to respond, that really varies from person to person. So it's a bit hard okay. to tell, um, you know. Yeah, there, and a lot of uh, science yet to, to be discovered on this, but le that leads to this next question. This is uh, from Butch, take a listen. Hi, Brett, it's Butch Giorgio here from Reading, Pennsylvania. And the question I would like to know is, how is this virus more dangerous than say the H1N1 virus back in 2009. All right, buddy, thanks. Let's all hang tough. All right, Doc. So the H1N1 is actually part of our yearly seasonal flu um, that we see every year. And when we compare COVID-19 to seasonal flu, um, the, one of the biggest differences is uh, the reproduction rate of the r not. And what this means is that if one person is infected, how many more individuals can this, inter this particular infected individual uh, infect? And so with seasonal flu, it's about 0 0.1. And with um, the uh, coronavirus disease, it's, you know, a little over two to two, between two and three. Um, so it's about 10 times uh, more um, virulent than seasonal flu. Okay, and just along those lines, a lot of different stats out there, and I understand we're trying to get our, our hands around the facts, but how long can the virus stay in the air? How long can it stay on surfaces, you know, that are not cleaned off, whether that's stainless steel or cardboard or wood? What is the life of this virus on those surfaces? So there's a number of different variables that come into play in terms of how long a virus can sur survive on a given surface, uh, whether it's obviously wood or metal um, or fabric. It depends on not just obviously the type of surface, but also depends on the humidity and the temperature. Um, and so a number of different factors come into play in terms of how long a virus can survive. It's not just a one answer and it kind of, you know, it's two hours and that's it. No, it actually varies depending on obviously the environment and things like that. So it's hard to tell. And again, it's a very the new virus. We've only known about this for, you know, a little over three months and the amount of information that we actually have is unprecedented. If you look at other infectious disease outbreaks, there was, we, we didn't come anywhere near as much, uh, as close to the amount of information that we've been getting for this particular virus. Okay, let's wrap it up with Renee. Take a listen to this question, Doc. We are in a very remote location. As long as we don't have people coming or going, this virus cannot be spread through just air particles. Am I correct in that? So again, Renee lives in a remote place. Um, she watches who comes in and goes. Um, what about her question? So we know that the primary means of transmission of this particular virus is through respiratory droplets. And now that can mean a number of different things. Now, this is where social distancing comes into play. We want to obviously make sure we don't have contact with other individuals that may be infected because obviously of getting infected. And on top of that, there's high touch surfaces. And this is why we constantly say wipe those down as well as washing your hands because we want to make sure people obviously don't get infected. And one of the things people should understand is this is a virus. It needs a host to be able 
able to survive. And so the whole goal right now is to basically limit um, or reduce the, the amount of times we can encounter this virus. So whether it's somebody that you come in contact with or touching a door handle or something that is high touch surface, we want to make sure we're, we're uh, applying everyday measures and then social distancing so we can basically uh, not get infected and not give the virus a reason to get, you know, infect other people. Dr. Sarah Madad, we really appreciate your time tonight answering questions. We'll continue to do it. Thanks.